I'm Janet Forrest, and this is The Bonds, The Mitchells, and The Dawn of Time. Episode 1, The Dawn of Precise Time. In this season of the podcast, we are going to take a closer look at two families, the Bonds and the Mitchells, and the immeasurable impact they had on our world today. From the two savvy entrepreneurial patriarchs to their children and descendants that would prove just as extraordinary. We'll dive into their personal struggles, the politics and controversies that hindered and helped their work, And we'll even do a little bit of 19th century name dropping. But before we get into the juicy details, we need to rewind the clock back to the early 1800s, when time was relative and relatively irrelevant. We're going to get a bit technical in this episode, but bear with us. It's important to understand the technology that was available at the time so you can appreciate the colossal advancements that the Bonds and the Mitchells made. Here's Jim Borzileri, Reference Library Associate at the Nantucket Athenaeum, to set the scene. Well, let's go back about 200 years and just say it's 1822 and you're on Nantucket. How do you know what time it is? They had clocks. They had very, very efficient clocks, but there was no way to determine how to set them. There were no electronic resources. They couldn't look on, you know, they couldn't look on their computer to see what the true time was. For that matter, there weren't even time zones. Those wouldn't come in until well into the 20th century. Nor was there any need for time zones because things just moved so slowly that it didn't matter that Boston time might be a little bit different than time somewhere else. Everybody could kind of keep their own time because the only way you'd get there would be on a fast horse or a relatively fast ship. You know, you didn't have to worry about calling somebody up and saying, what time is it over there? Am I waking them up? And so the way they were telling time was pretty much the way they would have been doing it thousands of years earlier, which is via essentially a sundial. If you could determine solar noon, that moment where the sun is directly overhead, it's halfway between sunrise and sunset. If you had a protractor, you could determine it's exactly a 90 degree angle with the ground, then that's local noon. And once you've got that, you can set your clocks and watches to that solar noon time. And depending on how big a town you have, they might fire a cannon or shoot a gun or drop a giant ball off a tower, something like that, just to let everyone know what time it is. And then they would just go to their clock and make whatever adjustments they had to make. And for most folks, that was absolutely fine. Unless you were, let's say, a navigator out at sea and you had to find out precisely where your location was, at which point the sundial just isn't going to work. We talk about latitude and longitude. Latitude is where you are north and south. That's always been fairly easy to determine because you can measure the angle of the sun on a given day. If you're lucky enough to be on the equator or between the Tropic of Cancer or in Capricorn, there's going to be a day where the sun is absolutely not only at 90 degree overhead, it's literally overhead 90 degrees to your position. So nothing casts shadows. And that makes it easy to tell where you are, because if you know on that day the sun is in this location, it's directly overhead, then you know exactly what your position is. But longitude is a little more difficult because you can't use any angles. It's all going to be relative. Where you are east or west is going to be east or west to what? Because it's got 360 degrees just the way we have for north and south. But where do you start? What's zero degrees? What's one degree? There's no way of really measuring it. And that becomes more of a political consideration than anything else. Now, the British had gotten the jump and they built their observatory at Greenwich in the 17th century, and they just said arbitrarily, okay, this is zero degree longitude. But nobody else necessarily went along with it, certainly not the French, they had their own ideas. And after we fought a revolution with England, there was not a great deal of enthusiasm for adopting their system. England not only got the jump on building the first observatory and creating a zero point, they also passed the 1714 Longitude Act that offered a monetary award to the first person who could invent a method for determining a ship's longitude while at sea. To make a very long, fraught story short, 
John Harrison, a self-educated carpenter and clockmaker, invented and perfected a device called the chronometer, a portable clock that would keep time at sea. While England had done some heavy lifting for innovation, American ships still needed a zero point closer to home. So what evolved was, as the clocks got more and more precise, people on Nantucket would set their clocks to Nantucket time. And they would wait until they had a perfect determination of solar noon. And there were watchmakers and jewelers and actually people who sort of doubled as astronomers who had very, very precise tools that could tell them exactly when it was solar noon, when the sun was exactly overhead. So they used a variety of instruments. They would use tools that we have sort of seen in museums. They have a sextant, a quadrant, and a transit, all of which are designed just to tell what is the angle of whatever it is I'm looking at. And the sextant, there's a beautiful one in the Whaling Museum, you can see it. Uh, it's, in, it's a remarkably complicated device. The design was perfected in the late 1700s, and it hasn't really changed that much. There have been some improvements in materials, but it's still the same idea that you can aim this at the sun and simultaneously know where you are relative to the horizon. And when you've got that angle, you know exactly what the angle of the sun is. And what you're really looking to see is when is it at 90 degrees to more or less the flat part of the ground. Sometimes they would have to lie down on the ship if the ship's rocking around. Then what they would do is they would immediately record that moment and they would run and take a look and see what the clock that they have stored somewhere on the ship, and these are called chronometers, is saying, because that clock was set to Nantucket time when they left Nantucket. So let's say hypothetically, you've taken your sighting, you know that it is now solar noon wherever I am west of Nantucket, and you go and look at the clock, and the clock says, well, right now it's exactly 6 p.m. in Nantucket, so it's six hours afternoon. So you now know that, well, it, the Earth revolves on its axis in 24 hours. I have gone six of those 24, that's one quarter, so I am 90 degrees west of Nantucket at that precise moment. And let's just say, coincidentally, the sun was directly overhead, and you know that it is the equinox, so you know you were right on the equator. Congratulations, you've now figured out where you are. And I'm sort of oversimplifying because even at this time with the best instruments they had available, measuring longitude was not precise. It could be off by a mile or more. Well, that's the thing when you think about what people were going through in the mid 1700s and earlier and not being able to determine their longitude while, while at sea. And that whole right, right. Um, longitude prize that was put out by the king and that Harrison ultimately through, I don't remember how many stages of chronometers that he went through to come up with the one that then basically William and Mariah and the Bonds would be using and utilizing and then also rating, which is basically telling the person how using their, your clock, your chronometer and their chronometer and telling them how much time they're gaining or losing over a period of time. Because if you are off by a couple of seconds, you could be off by hundreds of miles. That was Jason Leonardo Finger, historian and deputy director of the Mariah Mitchell Association. But just the whole process that went through for, for figuring out how to develop the chronometer because of all the different metals and different metals expand and contract differently based on temperatures and how right. that messed things up. And you had to think about, you know, when he finally came with the final one, but what, what they went through to bring it to that point. I mean, it was, you know, groundbreaking. Finally, ship captains could basically tell where they were at sea within a mile or so, which was great. But by the early 1800s, the equipment was not yet precise enough to navigate America's harbors with confidence. The lack of nautical surveys created a national security issue. The problem is, during that same time period, we didn't have very good charts We didn't of even our own harbors. Boston Harbor was a mystery. New York Harbor was a mystery. And the shoals around Nantucket were something of a mystery. There were local people that knew how to sail it, but there was nothing really written down. Whereas everybody knew that the British and the French and to some extent the Spanish had maps and charts that were actually better than ours. So there was this desire to come up with better ways of surveying, but also to establish a point somewhere in America where we say, OK, this is our starting point. We're not going to use the Royal Observatory. We're going to use our own zero point. In addition to the military and mapping concerns on the coast, by the 1830s, the nation's growing railroad system was reaching a dangerous and deadly roadblock. Many American railroads, particularly in New England, were built with one track. 
So if you're going from New York to Boston, it was on a single track. Well, that's great unless you've got two trains coming in opposite directions. Now, you've probably seen the old movies where you've got the conductor looking at his watch and finally he gives a signal and say, OK, it's time to go. Well, what he's doing is he's making a determination that there's not another train coming in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, the watches that were used at the time weren't very accurate. In addition, the no railroad had a you know had a uniform time zone or a uniform time stamp. It was more like the time at each station. So accidents occurred all the time. And in the early 1840s, there had been some absolutely horrific head-on collisions, and the public had just had enough. They say, you've got to clean this up. In summary, ships could navigate the open seas, but were running up on the rocks when they tried to come to shore. France and England had better maps of our coasts and harbors, and train travel was dangerously unreliable. The country needed to do something. We needed people with expertise in the sciences of astronomy, mechanics, and engineering who could do the work. And that presented another problem. The term scientist wasn't even coined until 1834. There weren't that many professional scientists. For most people, it was a hobby. If you you had to be well-to-do, it didn't pay well. In fact, it paid horribly. If you were a well-trained surveyor or astronomer, you might make a few thousand dollars teaching engineering, but you would probably make twice that as a railway engineer. There were very few schools that offered any kind of technical training. Most, most schools were sort of looking at a very classical education. They were designed to train clerics and lawyers, physicians, if not doctors, because they were dealing with more of the theoretical side of medicine. When we look at Harvard, we think of Harvard today as what it is, the well-endowed global research university. But if you go back to the early 1800s, it was a regional school. So yeah, I mean, science, astronomy was not professionalized yet. People going to college was vastly different than what people are going to college for today. Even with the right people and the right equipment, there was a lurking distrust in too much government intervention. There were a lot of people that felt that if we established a, you know, a government observatory, they would start telling people where their land begins and ends. And they didn't think that was something that the government should be involved in. So there was actually legislation passed that prevented the people who were doing the surveys from ever setting up an official observatory. So this became a bit of a challenge. A challenge, indeed. Way back in 1807, President Thomas Jefferson signed, quote, an act to provide for surveying the coast of the United States. While this officially established the U.S. Coast Survey, the entity wasn't properly funded until 1834, nearly 30 years later. You know, if if you'd say the U.S. Coast Survey today, no no one even knows what that was. But at one point, that was the single largest employer of, I guess we would say, academics and scientists at the time. It was almost a stealth kind of operation. The Coast Survey played a role in more ways than people realize. Today, basically, NOAA is what the Coast Survey, what basically the Coast Survey kind of became. While they weren't doing, you know, radar and all that fun stuff that we have today, they were doing all these astronomical and meteorological observations and tides and all kinds of other things. Because all that was being used to create maps for for ships. <laughs> so they were playing, again, a really large role in something that people didn't necessarily realize maybe was happening. I mean, there were all these coast surveys. It was like, a, it was almost like a a branch of the military because these coast survey ships that were going around and they were important. They were important parts of navigation. After a rocky start, the coast survey would really find its footing under the leadership of Alexander Dallas Bash. Because the coast survey had to deal with this issue of there's a limit to how far we can go. And when, I love saying his name, Alexander Dallas Bash became the head in what, 1843. This is His predecessor was technically extremely good. He was a man named Hassler. He's the one who founded the survey, but he was politically about as tone deaf as you could get. There were moments when they just basically caught all his funding saying, we don't know what this guy's doing. He may be making charts, but we haven't seen any yet. So they just cut off his funding for, at one point, I think it was like 10 years, but then they brought him back because the people that were doing it weren't very good. So when Bash got himself appointed, he was absolutely brilliant. But he was also politically very, very adept, and he very quickly reorganized and repositioned the Coast Survey to be as responsive as he could to the local needs and to get the maps and everything out as quickly as possible so people could understand what was going on. But to do this, 
because he had limits on how many people he could hire, he hired contractors. Bash starts building up a network. Included in that network was an extremely bright serial entrepreneur living on Nantucket by the name of William Mitchell. William Mitchell himself is is an amazing guy. I, you know, he was always sort of almost an afterthought because usually he comes into the story as Mariah learned this from her father, who was an amateur astronomer, and that's as far as it goes. But I mean, I was just amazed at how much of a serial entrepreneur this guy was, you know, that his yeah. family had money. Then, of course, the War of 1812 happened, and they're wiped out, and he was supposed to go to Harvard. Yes. But I, I've, I've heard two stories. One was either, it was probably a combination of A, his running out of money, and B, uh, he just couldn't bear to leave his, I guess, then fiance. You know, that was, in part, it was the, the War of 1812 was on, so it was really hard to get to and from. So that really played a role. But both William and Lydia Mariah's parents did come from fairly well-off families. Lydia's father was a whaling captain who was lost at sea. So the Mitchells, the William Mitchell family, had periods of time where they had a little bit extra and times where they struggled quite a bit. You know, he kind of was a jack-of-all-trades, master of all. I mean, he had 12 mouths if he did, 10 children. He was an academic. He was, we say amateur, but he, he was an astronomer. I mean, he was writing pieces that were, you name the scientific journal of the 19th century, there were articles by William in them. He had articles that were printed regularly in the, the papers on island about different astronomical phenomena. He rated the chronometers for all the whale ships that were homeported on Nantucket. It was at least, you know, 90 or so ships. He was known and he was able. He would always say, though, probably his first love was teaching, which is then what he did with his children and with Mariah. Yeah, and William was a well-known lecturer. He had done a series of presentations up in Boston for one of the philosophical societies. He's doing this in like January of 1843. And interestingly enough, one of them was about comets. It's a little prophetic there. But what was fascinating was to actually read the reviews of the people who were there said, he's a great speaker. He's very knowledgeable. This is an excellent start to the series this year. And then they said, of course, everyone marveled at the simplicity of his clothing. <laughs> yeah, they so you've got that Quaker, Quaker, you know, garb. yeah, that Quaker garb. He must have just, you know, everybody's dressed up in their 1840s finery and he's right. you know, in a very, very simple Quaker garb. It, yeah. it kind of goes back to some, a point you raised at the beginning that he was a scientist, but there were almost no real, quote, scientists around at that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you were either very, very wealthy or you were part of a tiny, tiny minority that might have been educated in Europe. And I think William was also just a lot of fun and, and just very down to earth. And I think he was a person who people gravitated towards because he was just a genuinely nice person. He was a warm person who tried to help others. And there's a lot of different stories about that kind of happening and sometimes him getting into trouble because he was trying to help people. Though many in Boston and beyond weren't sure what to make of this curious Quaker, soon they would be following his lead and replicating his work across the country. The meridian stones that are downtown that are by the Pacific Bank and in front of the Quaker Meeting House, which were put up by William, would later have Congress enact a law telling cities and towns that they needed to install them. But William Mitchell beat Congress by quite a bit and he put them up. The meridian stones that we have here on Nantucket are among the first in the country. They played an incredible role in survey and were incredibly important enough, like I said, that William Mitchell was the first and then the U.S. federal government decided, no, everybody should have these. Most places, you know, let them fall down, fall apart, be taken away. But we have some of the few that are still in their original sites. Also in the network that Bash was building was another William who was living a parallel life in Boston. William Cranch Bond. He was a clockmaker. He was part of a family firm that was founded in the late 1700s. He was born in the 1790s. And he turned out to be a, what we would probably call these days a mathematical and a mechanical genius. When he was very young, he built his first clock out of wood, and it actually worked. He's also credited with building the first true ship's chronometer that was made in the United States. And he did this working off what were basically schematics from a French designer, and it worked very, very well. He began to specialize in making the chronometers. And these were, you know, remarkably expensive, very, very precise watches. Because they were made by essentially one man and eventually by a workshop, they were all one-offs. Each one was kind of unique. We didn't have anything near resembling the kind of mass production we have today. 
He apprenticed with his father. He was self-taught. He had very little formal education. And his mindset, even when he became very, very successful, was more of a middle-class artisan entrepreneur, as opposed to someone who truly saw himself as an upper-class you know, academic professional. He eventually prospered. He moved to what was then the rural area of Dorchester, Massachusetts, just south of Boston. And he converted his house into a mini observatory. When he could afford it, he bought equipment and his rationale was, well, I need this for my work. If I'm going to build watches and test them, I'm going to have to know exactly when noon is so I can tell exactly how much time they gain and lose. Uh, this worked into its own kind of sub-profession. This was called calibrating the watch. Do you think he understood how important this work was? Yes, I think they had a sense because their clients were very well to do. You know, they were selling to ships, they were selling ship owners, they were selling to railroads. This was a vital part of the industry because everyone recognized if you did not have this clock that was rated and repaired, if you didn't have these other tools, you're going to run up on the rocks. He was very, very successful at this. And these watches were selling for about $300 each. Uh, and even a used one would go for close to $300. They didn't really drop in price because once they were built, they were tanks. If you maintained it, you could, you know, you could use that same device for, you know, for decades before it needed an overhaul. As a sign of his abilities in 1834, Bond was received a contract to repair and rate the U.S. Navy chronometers because it was determined that he was the only person in New England who could do this. And again, in the absence of an official observatory, he was the only one who had even remotely the closest material. In 1839, Harvard came to him with an offer. Uh, they couldn't pay him any money, but if he was willing to move to Cambridge, they would essentially allow him to set up an, an official observatory. Most of it initially would be his equipment, but by getting outside support, they hoped to build a new observatory a few years later. And he accepted that. It was kind of his fiefdom. He wasn't being paid. He kind of controlled who came in and came out. There was no teaching required, right? even though he was at Harvard. So it's just kind of, you can run your own shop, and now we have this observatory. It was constructed about a mile outside Harvard Square at a place called Summer House Hill. And even though it's now smack in the middle of what we would think of as downtown Cambridge, someone said at the time, described it as a remote place surrounded by fields and meadows with few neighbors and few facilities for reaching Harvard Square or Boston. And they built it there because they thought, well, it'll never build up. This will be a good place to build. It'll be well away from town. We don't have to worry about city lights. And that was done about 1840. Even as the government and wealthy businessmen invested in the sciences, there was always a little bit of distrust. Bond, like Mitchell, would face some push and pull. The comet of 1843, which sort of came out of nowhere and everybody was looking up. And this is a time when comets were still scary. objects of, yeah, they were scary. What They're does this mean? Omens. They were, yeah. People thought the Mitchells were crazy when they would observe eclipses even. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who knows what chances you're taking? And, you know, and the problem was people in Boston were going to the observatory and saying, where's this comet going to go? Is it going to hit us? Is it going to pass by? Is the tail going to pass through us? Because that was another omen of bad things happening. And unfortunately, you know, Bond said, I just don't know the equipment. And that triggered a fundraising effort among some very wealthy Bostonians, because this was sort of the height of the Boston maritime industry. And more than a few of them were now investing in these newfangled railroads in this out of the way town called Chicago. So they were starting to make some money in a different place. By 1847, a state-of-the-art telescope is now being installed at the Harvard Observatory. And who is one of the members of the visiting committee? Why, William Bond's very good friend now, William Mitchell. Yeah. And so the Mitchells and the Bonds are just constantly sending information back and forth to each other. And that passes down to their, to their children. Just one more thing about William Bond. He wasn't one to stay in his lane. He always had an eye out for other technological advances that could be incorporated into his work. When the telegraph was perfected, he pounced on it and he said, this is great. We can use this to better assess longitude because now rather than sending flags or shooting cannons, you can just send a tap. Because if you think about how they used to do it, let's say you've got your sextant, you're on the ship, you're taking a series of observations. Finally, you go, now, well, now what do you do? You've got to reach down, 
You've got to find the watch. You've got to focus on the watch. You've got to write the time down. Eight, nine, 10 seconds have gone by. What Cranchbond would do and what made his reputation in the 1850s is he came up with a system that combined looking in the sky, knowing exactly when it is solar noon. And then rather than having to have an assistant write it down or have you write it down, he had it connected to a drum that was rotating and the drum was constantly showing the beats of the clock. It was connected to a clock and a drum and every second it would tap out a little mark. And so when it was exactly solar noon, you would press what was essentially a telegraph key and interrupt that circuit. And so now you've got a gap. And now looking at that gap, looking at that piece of paper, you now know exactly when it's solar noon to about you know a 10th of a second, if not less. He just improved everything by an order of magnitude. It sounds kind of silly to us, but this was called the American method. And overnight, it changed the determination of longitude. Specifically, this innovation would address the problem mentioned earlier. Remember the trains that were smashing into each other because there was no universal way of determining time? A railroad consortium got together and they said, OK, we're going to use the time service provided by the Harvard Observatory, which will send out a signal every day at noon. These will go through telegraph lines to the William Bond and Sons office, and they in turn will use that to synchronize the clocks and watches that they're going to send us. What would happen is there would be a wire that would run from the William Bond and office to a clock, let's say at South Station, at exactly noon on the day they send out the signal, the clock would just adjust itself back. If it had been running at 12.01, now it's 12 o'clock. And this was the service that was provided via the Harvard Observatory, via lease government lines, via William Bond and Sons to the railroads. And they would maintain this service well into the late 1800s. Even with their fancy equipment on loan from the Coast Survey and connections to Harvard, William and William were still locally based. It would be their children who would bring the technology and their names to the rest of the world. Alexander... Bosch. He said to William, I, I want to hire Mariah. And William said, absolutely no, because if you do, you'll lose your job. It wasn't that he didn't think Mariah could do it. And it's not that he didn't want Mariah to have the job, but he knew that the superintendent would be jobless for hiring a woman. Bond wasn't running this by himself. The company was called William Bond and Sons because three would become instrumental in the business. Joseph, he was both an astronomer and an instrument maker. George Phillips would be William's successor at the Harvard Observatory. And also Richard Fifield was perhaps the most mechanically inclined and probably the closest to his father in terms of being a mechanical genius. That's next time. This has been a production of the Nantucket Athenaeum. It was written, edited, and narrated by me, Janet Forrest. Special thanks to the Athenaeum's reference library associate, Jim Borzilleri, and historian and deputy director of the Mariah Mitchell Association, Jason Leonardo Finger, for their research and insights. Please check the show notes for more information and sources on the research. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, please rate, review, and subscribe. It helps others find the show. If you really enjoyed it, please share it with a friend or a colleague. The Nantucket Athenaeum is located at 1 India Street in Nantucket, Massachusetts. We would love for you to stop by. You can visit us online at nantucketathenam.org. Stay tuned for our next episode of The Bonds, The Mitchells, and The Dawn of Time.